Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Black Lawyers Podcast. Today, we have the pleasure of interviewing social justice advocate, entertainer, comedian, actress. I'm sure she has some other adjectives <laughs> that we can add on there. I think, I think that's quite enough. Uh, Amanda Seals, we have Amanda Hello, Seals. hello. Thank you for having me. You know, Amanda, let me just tell you something. You say what most of us are afraid to say. So we're going to give you a award just for that. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see something and I'll say, I wish I could be like Amanda and just say no. this and not care. <laughs> but I'm not allowed to say certain things. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm just going to like the comment. Of a Why are you post. not allowed? Well, you know what? To be honest with you, when you um, are in the legal profession, believe it or not, lawyers, doctors, we have all these oaths, we sign all these licenses and things like that. And right. believe it or not, they hold us to a higher standard. So someone can literally take what you said or what you did and they can say you're being unethical they can file a complaint against you so we have to be mm -hmm. very careful unless you're saying hey i'm not practicing anymore then i guess it, it, it doesn't matter yes right but right. some that's when some people they go into media just say hey i'm not practicing anymore so you can't use this against me uh but if okay. you're you know if you're still practicing and things like that sometimes it's 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 difficult but we're happy that you say what we are are thinking. We know you have the whole smart, funny, and black movement. We know you have your tour. We'll talk about that in, um, uh, towards the end, so that people know where they can see you next. Um, mm -hmm. But first up, we, you know, I make all my guests play hot topics. So uh, we're gonna we're just gonna do two quick hot topics before we dive into your uh, individual questions. So our our guests can find out more about you if they don't already know. Um, all right. So the, First hot topic is the Mississippi water crisis. I actually caught a little bit of your live yesterday, uh, plugging some resources. So I was like, oh, okay, this is great because I was going to talk to her about this anyway. You know, since August 29th, if you're listening, you don't know what's going on with water crisis because I know there's just so much going on in the world. Monkeypox, COVID, you know, it's just so much. Going right. on. But <laughs> it's just right. like, what part of the, you know, the, what part of the, the, you know, part, what part of revelations are we on right now? Um, but the Mississippi water crisis, you know, since the 29th, you know, Mississippi residents, they haven't had clean water. There was a flood that overflood their, their main water camp. So tell us, you know, your thoughts on the fact that, well, let me ask you this. Do you think if this happened in a more white, affluent city, you know, same situation, it was a flood, you know, it overtook the plant and... You know, all of a sudden people didn't have hot water. Do you think these people would still be waiting for clean water? Yeah, but we know the answer to that. I mean, they're not. Like, it did happen in a city that has white people, and the affluent white people have water, and the Black people don't. Like, now, Tell us more. Which which city? T tell me more, because I only know very surface about No, this I'm just saying, issue. I only know very surface as well, but I mm -hmm. know that in Jackson, like, there are pockets of Jackson, there are pockets outside of Jackson that were also affected, but there should have been... Oh, I there see. It's been rectified. resolved. Yeah, it's been resolved. I so, see what you're saying. you know, I think it's like with Katrina, you know, we saw that the French Quarter, they got they got focused and busy on getting that back together when the Ninth Ward was still underwater and, you know, suffering for quite some time. Right. So we. We also know that these are also the difference, the difference between like places that are owned versus rented, you know, that are um, supported because they also support legislators mm -hmm. um, and keep them in power. So there's a quid pro quo, there's a quid pro quo that's happening um, versus a public servant um, uh, responsibility that's happening. We saw this in Flint, you know, the, the fact that the people who were responsible for Flint got off scot-free. You know, I mean, it was merely an inconvenience for them. Um, but ultimately, this is at the core, the result of corrupt politicians who are lining their pockets with the money that should be used to correct infrastructure and to create uh, equal living conditions for all parties within their constituency. And we know full we know for a fact that that doesn't happen in this country, but we also know that specifically black and brown bodies are not valued in the same way in this country. And I went, I went, I went, I went on a tour um, with the Hip Hop Caucus in 2014, I think it was, and we, it was called the Toxic Tour. And we went to a number of cities around the nation 
and learned about like environmental racism, which I had never heard about. And it was me. Me either. This is new. Okay, for me. It, it, <laughs> yeah. was, it was me, uh, rapper D1, and um, R&B artist Raheem Devon. And we were with Reverend Yearwood, who's the head of the Hip Hop Caucus. He's an activist and organizer. He's been working, you know, in the communities for ever. Um, and we went to Virginia Beach, Detroit, uh, Atlanta, North Car Durham, North Carolina. Um, and we went somewhere in Texas. I can't remember. And we went to all these different cities and learned about how by proximity uh, to different, so we learned that how redlining and the ways in which districts have been gerrymandered and organized also changed the ways in which funds and budgets are allocated, which also changed the ways in which different communities got to receive resources and how that affected them in terms of their access to clean air and in terms of uh, access to clean water, in terms of access to even food, right? Because permits, et cetera, determines like where grocery stores are built and where fast food places are built, et cetera. So like, this was a very eye-opening experience for me because it let me understand that like, wow, like the, the levels of race, the levels that racism has permeated within our society for so many of us are beyond even our scope of comprehension. And like to, to even see like, oh, this is how racism has now, it like, it affects people's air, you know? And it's why schools in, in certain communities are built in such proximity to nuclear power plants, to coal plants, et cetera. There's a, such an insane amount of asthma that is, that is pervasive throughout the community. You know, we looked in, we went to Detroit and we drove through Marathon in Detroit, which used to be the site of like a lot of industry for cars. And then they realized that the car plants were giving off all this toxic fucking air. And so many people in the community were getting cancer. They had to turn, they had to close down the plant, but all these people are still there and the air is still toxic. And when you drive through, you have to turn up your windows because you can literally like smell the thickness of the air. And so when we see what's going on in Jackson, it's just a continuation of the continued effort of this nation and the white supremacists in this nation to keep power by oppression um, and to continue and, and, to, and to oppress in ways that are just nefarious, right? Like just literally beyond. Well, they, you know, they say, they say is cliche as it sounds, you said this yesterday on your live, like, this is why you have to be careful who you're voting into office. This is why you do have to still write your congressman. Like, as much as it seems very, like, old school to think about these things and do these things, like, yeah, it's going to, at some point, it's going to trickle down. In fact, your local legislators affect you way more, sometimes more than the president. Like, the, to me, those Every elections more are- more than the president. Right. So Every you got it. You can't just disregard and say, oh, I don't need to go vote because it's just the That's mayor. That's who it's you need to governor. vote for. Exactly. That's literally who you need to vote for. Like, the governors are who are deciding Roe v. Wade. Like, the governors are who are deciding, you know, if marijuana is legal, the governors are who are deciding- um, you know, you're the, the way the school systems are operating within your Nate, within your state, et cetera. I mean, it's like the fact that we're even seeing conversations around like interracial marriage and around, um, gay marriage, et cetera, you know, lets you know that like, this is only the beginning and people may think like, oh, the Supreme court, like that was a crazy run. Like that was just when they were in session, they won't be in session again. It's going to be a crazy run again, you know? Right. They're all great right now. It's not, yeah. <laughs> they're coming back. They're coming back. <laughs> But you know, this whole thing about voting, I think so many of us really don't understand the actual effect of voting and don't understand that it's not just voting. I always say you got to vote and, you know, you vote and you get behind organizations within your community that matter to you. Like, are there community organizations that are working um, like, OK, there are community organizations that are working to rewrite the 94 crime bill, crime bill and to rewrite the wrongs that the 94 crime bill created right across the nation. There are organizations that are working to, to actually get behind boards, city boards to reallocate funds away from police into resources that actually help communities so that you don't have to police those communities so much because there isn't as much crime in those communities because those communities have resources. There are organizations that are supporting 
abortion and that are supporting, you know, women who are trying to get health care in these ways that are now being impinged upon. Like there are so many organizations that never stopped working that you can also support. Now, you may not be the one who's going to wake up on Saturday and escort people to their abortion clinic, but maybe you can donate. You know, maybe you can um, sh- at the very least sharing your social media. But you said something just now where you said old school. And I think that that's something that can't be overlooked. I think we've become so wrapped up in like the techno- technological advancements of things, but we don't realize that we haven't advanced as a people. We haven't advanced as a society. We've literally just advanced fiber optically and it's to our detriment. And I feel like the most um, effective way that we can create change is literally going back old school, face to face. You know, there are people who are canvassing. When I had Ayanna Presley on my podcast, Small Doses, I was like, you know, what are Democrats doing to really try and get people out to vote? And she was like, we're literally going door to door at this point. <laughs> like, we're going to have to knock on the door. Yeah. Door and get and I'm like, good. Out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm like, good, because y'all keep, you know, sending out these emails and. You yeah, because people just skip over them. Or, <laughs> like, all right, I here's see, another I- fundraising request or here, you know, people just skip over them. And I think uh, and and I know that you plug, I believe you plug Woke Vote uh, yes. yesterday, Woke that vote. page of people specifically want to. Um, see what organizations and things they're partnering with with the Mississippi border crisis. If you're listening to this, um, you know, and you want to help, you can, you know, sometimes I'm like, well, I don't know where to start. I get overwhelmed. Like you said, you can start with one organization that can kind of point you in the direction and give you, like you said, very minor things where it's just like, Mm -hmm. hey, just share this. Or, you know, if you want to really ramp it up, hey, here's the email. You can write a letter to this person, you know. Um, Like Another good one is build power. That mm-hmm. does that, B-I-L, uh, it's B-L-D-P-W-R, mm-hmm. buildpower.com. They're another okay. organization that like basically serves as an algorithm, like they serve as an aggregate to other organizations. Okay, so like, you go to Build Power and you're like, I want to figure out how I can help. <laughs> right. That's a you good know, starting place. Like, yeah. here, here's, mm-hmm. here's your start. Um, well, thank you for that information. Like I said, we're, we will be monitoring this crisis. I, you know, it's been since August 29th that they haven't had any more. I, I just, I'm hoping this doesn't go on too much longer. I feel bad for people having, you know, even the college kids, they have to leave campus or doing online classes. I mean, like I said, it's, it's amazing how one little situation can just trickle down into so many other things and really just like, you know, ruin other things. Um, and so we're just, you know, we're praying for the residents that this is obviously resolved sooner versus later uh switching gears by design yes uh switch switching gears um to a second hot topic that is developing um you are obviously a comedian you are an entertainer um and right now we have two comedians two entertainers in the hot seat over a psa they did with funny or die uh, you know, I've been a fan of Tiffany, Tiffany Haddish. I don't know much about Aries Spears. Obviously, I think some people know a little bit about both comedians. You know, the facts of this particular story are still developing. However, what is your perspective about just comedians, entertainers, when they have to decide what to participate and what's not to participate and how sometimes you guys are vilified, even if, if, if you don't mean to, I mean, even, you know, Chris Rock telling a joke and Will Smith getting upset and, and that went on forever. So you just have a lot of comedians and things being in the hot seat. And I know this is a big part of what you do. You are a comedian. So mm-hmm. how do you, how do you balance when you get on stage and say, hmm, I personally think this is funny, but maybe if I say this, this is just going to go too far left. And maybe I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I should entertain it. What, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, listen, I think we all have like a moral compass that we live by and that compass is set differently for different folks and it's set differently at different times, you know, in our growth process, in our maturation, in our intellectual capacity, in our, even in our circumstances, right? Um, So I think that right there is just a very, very, very nuanced thing to, to an individual. Like there isn't just a bottom line to that. That being said, as a comedian, you know, the goal is for a lot of us is like, how do I push this further? How do I push this further? How do I push this further? And I think sometimes things go too far, but I also feel like there's there's a certain expectation at this point 
It's okay. It's okay, kids. Right? Okay. We can pause it. We're going to be editing it, Kenny. <laughs> There's a ghost. You were saying there's an expectation mm -hmm. at this. Point. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's an expectation of not just comedians, but of like everybody to just nail it every time. Um, particularly in the public sphere, I feel like if you say something off putting or if you make a misstep or you make a mistake the the pylon is so immediate that it's not possible that it can be coming from a genuine place right it's like people are so quick i mean i've been a subject of this right like people um are just I mean, I think you Frothing mentioned the thing about the, the AK mouth. sweater in your, your role. Yeah. Your role like with Tiffany on mouth. a show. Like, yeah. On Insecure <laughs> that people were like, she's not an AK. She can't wear that shirt. And it's like, look, they gave me the sweater. They gave me the script. I showed up. I did my job. Take it up with them. Do not take it people up. People are just mad. Like, I just feel like, I feel like, you know, I, I don't know how much, like, I think, I think on one, and one angle, some people want to look at it like, we're all just holding people accountable in ways that they need to be held accountable. And it's time for us as a society to, to operate more virtuously, et cetera. But the whole idea around like being a comedian and determining like what is right and what is not, that's, that's not based on like virtue of society. That's based on funny or not. Like, and I think that- right, because the I, to the point some people made, you know, People making fun of R. Kelly. Dave Chappelle did the same thing, playing the R. Kelly song. All that he did. It was hilarious. About that. It, it, so, you know, so at the end of the day, so it's, it's like, like, it's like, well, which, which one is appropriate? And then, and then, you know, the thing that they tried to put back out there as it relates to Tiffany and Aries, it was something that's been online for like 12 or 13 years. It's not like this is like something that was posted yesterday. So sometimes we're just like the timing of things just seems so odd to me. And then when the power on just, happened so quickly it's like but if this was just wrong all the time it should have just been wrong five years ago it should have been wrong 12 years i mean we should have been but this is the thing about see <laughs> we're in a different time and that's the thing like so many more people have access to so many more things and i truly 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 feel like that doesn't necessarily just just because we have more access doesn't mean we have more intellect it doesn't mean we have more um compassion it doesn't that's what i meant earlier about like just because we have greater technology doesn't mean we've become greater as a society or greater as a people. It's not like we're more responsible. It's not like we're more empath, you know, empathetic. And it would, but I think it should be that, right? Like I think there's something to be said for, you know, looking back at something and being like, oh, well, during that time, that kind of wasn't seen as that crazy, you know? And now at this time it is. And people it's received hold differently. People right to a standard now of something that's like years ago. I'm not saying that in regard to Tiffany and Aries. I actually Can you please? Can you get it? <laughs> I'm doing a podcast. I love these impromptu moments. Do you have a dog? It's a dog. It's a dog. And he's just like he's just like, you're mind. doing a podcast so it's time for me to talk. <laughs> but I don't know why he's barking. And I'm like And no worries, we. <laughs> and no worries, we're, we're gonna cut it so we can cut. Oh, it. I know you're gonna cut it. I mean, <laughs> this is what no happens worries. when people have to do things at their house. It's like yes, you're, that's, you know, that's life. part of this. Like you said, this new technology, this new world. We're gonna do interviews in person. We have life just gets in the way. But to your point, not necessarily specifically to Tiffany and Aries, P Aries PSA situation that's developing right now. But you're just saying, generally speaking, there's just. Again, there's different perspectives, different things at different times sit well and, and maybe 15 years. But slavery years, was legal. You know? Right. And now all of a sudden, right. So at some point- You know what I'm saying? Like, shit changes. Yeah. 
And in the and best of I, our I, efforts, we look back and we go, remember, I did that that time and now I know better. So my bad. And here's my thing. She's obviously apologized. This is a developing story. I just think um, something you something I, I want to end with as it relates to this topic, something you said that I think is really important in terms of even though we have evolved in a society like technologically right about like how there's just like this lack of empathy like we don't show people grace we don't give it like a second like okay let's just give it a second let's hear all the sides like it's like the minute anything it's like people are ready to pile on so my thing is I, I, I follow I think a lot of people have followed Tiffany's journey um you know um not maybe not so much as Aries, but definitely Tiff, Tiffany's very open about, you know, her struggles and how she got to where yeah. she is and all that. And I think people really do relate to her and people really do care about her. So at the end of the day, you know, she's in 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 the immediate, obviously issued a general apology. And obviously she can't talk more about it because of it being a developing uh, legal suit. But I just want to say that I I want to I want to extend people grace. Like that that's just who I am. And like you said, everybody has a different war code and things like that. But whatever has happened, um, I personally just want to extend her grace. And I'm 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 wishing, you know, that situation resolves the best way it can obviously resolve at this point. So I think there's also just something to be said for like grace, uh, not only grace, but also just um no one is given credit for how they've like been existing. You know what I mean? I think that a lot of times. It's, it's as if everything that you do is the first thing that you've done and people don't seem to acknowledge like, but you've been on this earth this whole time, like operating a certain way and showing up a certain way. And that doesn't account for anything. Right. So any good she's done goes out the window. Anybody she's helping goes out the window. So, yeah. And I, I don't, I don't know Aries. We, we've chit chatted a couple of times on Instagram, um, you know, but Tiffany is my sis and, you know, I, I definitely hope that this all gets sorted out and I did not see the video, so I can't speak to that. But what I can speak to is, you know, the person that I know, her heart is a, a very solid and loving one. And I think there are definitely times where we've got, you know, people get wrapped up in scenarios that they may not fully understand or they get wrapped up in situations where they go too far and all the above and i know that there's people listening like well that would never happen to me and it's like maybe not it's just it's just like the will smith thing you don't know what would happen if you were in that role and someone was talking about you don't know what you will do in the moment until it actually happens to you you can never until it happens because sometimes people say well i would never do a but you don't right really know until it happens and I and I think when people do wrong things making it right apologizing and doing whatever they need to do to fix it because they can't undo whatever everybody's a judge this is the black lawyers podcast that everybody is a fucking (laughs) judge (laughs) you know I see people like Nick Kyrgios was very upset at himself for losing his quarterfinal match in the U.S. Open and he congratulated his you know opponent and then he proceeded to beat up two rackets and people are like, he is the worst. I can't believe how this display of anger is so demeaning to the sport. And I'm like, no, demeaning to the sport was the racism that the Venus and Serena, that Venus and Serena Williams had to experience as Over black 20 girls. years, yeah. Yeah. That's the, that's de- that's demeaning to the sport. Demeaning to the sport is the way y'all acted like Sharapova was this fucking queen and she was doping and being a nasty racist for this whole time. That's demeaning to the sport. Like don't like get the fuck out of here. He's mad because he lost. His mother he's is enti- dying and he's entitled to to be upset. Tennis, like get like he beat up a racket. Take him to the take him to the stake. Like, yeah. You yeah. Know, so I just want people to be a little bit more, I call it curiosity as compassion. Mm. And I feel like it's a practice that we can do individually, like in our own relationships, in our own um, like circle, in our own intermediary circle, as well as just as we look at people on the outside. And it's like literally just being curious about, oh, why did that happen? Or what is actually going on there versus being definitive based on the few assumptions that you're able to make, because the truth is 
nine times out of 10, you're judging based on your projections. <laughs> so it's really yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's very subjective. It's very personal. And I think sometimes people forget that. And like I said, uh, you know, we're, we're wishing her well, this is a developing story as we will continue to monitor it closely, but all in all, however it resolves, we're, we're, we're wishing her well. Switching gears into why we're here to talk about you, of course. Um, Let's do it. Y- you know, it's like you think you know things about people. And I ask questions and I always learn something like quirky about all my guests. Like Maxine Waters used to dance. Uh, like Hill Harper. <laughs> Hill Harper beat, uh, like almost beat some, you know, prisoners of Barack Obama, to, Obama in like a basketball game. I get just random stuff that I would just never you know, you just never think you will get by asking these questions. I hope so. I don't disappoint. Okay. <laughs> well, you're all, you're so already so interesting. So I can I can only imagine. Um, but who Thank were you. you before Amanda Seals? You know, the entertainer, the comedian, the actress, and all these things. I mean, obviously, you were someone before all of this. Can you tell the the audience a little bit a little bit about like where you went to school and just like what led you up to this point of being who you you, you became? I genuinely have been like this my entire life. I'm not even seriously. Yes. So you've always Literally. been like, like he, and when people find this out, they're like, "Oh wow, you you've really been like this." Like my mom is visiting. I can call her up here. She will tell you she has been like this the whole time. My mom all said like you were a very intense child. Um, yeah, like I mean, I was on the mic and performing at like four, you know, and you know, man, do the thing you had done, you know, and, and being like summoned to like perform. And it's like, oh, you mean that thing that I whipped up the other day? You know, like, I remember at one point I had like this, this bit that I would do, which was Michael Jackson singing the Star Swing of Banner. And I just remember being like six and being asked everywhere we went, like, do the Michael Jackson thing in the Star Swing of Banner, you know? And I always had it at the ready. But I was always just a very... um precocious outspoken curious kid like to you know everyone's annoyance um but it was always like but why but why but why you know and then you sit with it a little bit and then you come back okay but see then you but you had said that da 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 I'll know? be honest with you you could have been a lawyer everyone I would be, I, that was the first thing I was thinking. I was like, I wonder why they did, I mean, I know you're originally, are you originally from New York? Where are you originally from? I'm originally from LA. Originally LA and from Orlando. LA. Yeah. LA and Orlando. Okay. Okay. But you went to school, New York, went to. I went to school, I went to undergrad at Purchase College and I went to graduate school at Columbia for African-American studies. And I have been told all my life, like, you should have been a lawyer. Like you argue like a lawyer, <laughs> like, you know, you make connections like a lawyer. I'm like, what? a loophole here that says that if we actually apply section uh, um you know I will say this I feel like it's really I've just always been a very type a like I was a high strung kid I like things a certain way you know I was very particular but then at the same time I'm like a free spirit about other things Mm -hmm. so that confuses people (laughs) Cause it's like, oh, I thought you was a free spirit. And I'm like, no, I was free about that. I'm not, free about I'm not free about this. I like this, this way, you know? Um, like I'm free about my food touching on my plate. Like, I don't care about that. You know, there are people who are very particular about that. I don't care Me? about that. I don't like my food. <laughs> See, like my food can touch on my plate. I'm like, fine, 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 no problem. But, you know, I'm not free about things like, uh, let me think of something I'm very particular about. Time. Okay. Very particular about time. Like when people, when people are just reckless with my time and they're just like, oh, like I thought it was no problem. Da, da, da. I'm just like, I, I'm not free like that. I have friends who are like, if someone shows up 30 minutes late, they're like, no biggie. I'm like, we're done. I can't, I don't even know. Well, because I always tell people you can't get your time back. Unfortunately, you can always make more money, but you can't get time back. But I think that's a good transition to my next question. You said you were always this way. You're particular about certain things. What led you to be a social justice advocate? Because at the end of the day, you didn't have to use your plan. I mean, you could have just made all your dough, being comedian, actress, taking the big roles, and kept your mouth kind of quiet about 
certain things. I mean, the fact that you have a whole, I don't think most of our audience knows you have a whole freaking degree uh, in African-American studies. So that that was one thing when I, I looked you up, I said, wow, she has a degree. And I, like, I don't think most people would know that about you. So I'm just wondering when it when did it kind of click in you like, yeah, I'm this great entertainer and people like to see me act and be funny and all that. But like, you know, my people are important to me too. You know, these these certain causes are important to me too. When did that switch kind of go off in you? I think it, well, first of all, I feel like I grew up in a house where my mother's from Grenada. Grenadians in general are revolutionary people. Like we're just very politically inclined and, um, you know, the whole island, you know, it's very, they're very national, national patriotic, nationalistic. They're just very, like Grenadians are very Grenadian. Okay. <laughs> and um, I grew up with a lot of Bob Marley playing mm -hmm. and there was and for what it's worth like i grew up watching blackness like i grew up watching the cosby show and a different world and family right. matters and you know fresh prince of bel-air like and I, I don't was... think people realize how important having those sort of positive black yes. images regardless of what yes. you feel about these people what they've done in their personal lives what Correct. they did on screen i'll be honest with you i would not be a lawyer if it wasn't for Claire Huxtable. I would Claire be a Huxtable. lawyer if it wasn't for Maxine Shaw telling people off and living living. So single. let me tell so, you, <laughs> I go. in undergrad, I had a professor, Professor Donna Ayin Davis, who is my dog to this day, and I took um, Black Pop Culture 101, and she really contextualized for us in that class that when it comes to Black people's pop culture, it's not just a flash in the pan like our pop culture is a part of our like anthropological existence like Maxine Waters is a real person like okay like it's not like um on these other white tv shows like Rachel and Monica like they are in a pop culture world of friends okay their impact doesn't extend beyond the show friends even though we know them as part of pop right. culture. But it's not like, you know what? Because I'll be honest with you, I don't even know what they did for a living. So right. I can't you didn't say... become a chef because Monica be because Monica was a chef. Right. 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 But within black popular culture, our characters, because of the lack of representation that we've had, because of our inabilities to tell our own stories, et cetera, when we get those spaces, it is so much more impactful. And so for me that class helped to contextualize in a real way the fact that like, even if I am a part of this space as an entertainer, I'm still impacting my people in a, in a great way. Uh, and and, and it, I'm still impacting my people in a way that carries gravitas. And so it means that I need to have a certain level of like responsibility and, and awareness about it. And other people may not feel that way, but that is something that was like very illuminated for me while I was in college and I was already coming there with this awareness that I had from being a part of the Mac Knight Achievers, which was like a, 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 a Mac Knight Achievers was a part of the um, UCF University of Central Florida program that they had it was extracurricular for like black kids that were achieving in, in um, academics, but it was like, you go in here, it's going to be a bunch of black kids in a the room. They're going to just keep, they're going to drill into you how great you are <laughs> and mm -hmm. like, and how you need to continue to be great and represent your people. And you go listen, to the urban I, league. I, I tell people all the time, listen, and this number has not changed. I swear to God, less than 5% of black lawyer, of lawyers in the U S are black. And that number has not changed. Okay. It's been long time, hundreds, of, you know, hundreds, at least a hundred wow. years or 75 years, but we're always less than 5%. It's the same thing in the medical profession. That number is pretty similar. So when you see a black doctor on TV, TV who's mm -hmm. married to a black mm -hmm. lawyer, it is a yes. unicorn. It's like, this doesn't, this doesn't happen. Actually recently, right. um, I didn't recently meet, she was an intern for me for a short second who was a, a, a law school intern who's out here now. She just wrote a book, uh, Therapy. I'm always talking about therapy isn't just for white people. She just came out with a book. Mm -hmm. Her mom is a doctor and her dad is a lawyer. It just, I mean, they literally did a whole New York Times article on just like this highly wow. intelligent black family. <laughs> and it, and I love that they have the article, but a part of me is sad. Like, wow, it's just so sad that that's just not the norm, that they're just this, this unicorn of a this of anomaly. A 
it, it, it just, so, you know. It shouldn't be paradoxical. You're right. It shouldn't be. But this is part of the reason why I have this podcast. I want to bring on people that are not just lawyers and judges and politicians, obviously, but advocates like you that say, well, you know what? I have this platform. I'm going to use it. Uh, with that being said, what do you have like a, I don't want to say a top, but is there a cause, cause or causes right now? You're I didn't like, get to finish most- answering the question. <laughs> Go back, go back. <laughs> so what yeah, I was going to say, though, was that college really did this for me. And I think a lot of people, you know, we're watching people downplay like college and higher education, et cetera, et cetera. But when I went to Columbia, Manny Marable, rest in peace, Professor Marable, Dr. Marable walked in that day and said, do you want hip hop to die? And I was like, oh, wow, that's a <laughs> hell of a way to start the this class, like, I just didn't know that I didn't, it was, but that quickly, it lets you know, like, oh, he was already creating that juxtaposition between like what we're going to be doing in this academic space to this pop culture space, which is a cultural space for us as black folks. And we, as Columbia, a lot of people don't know is across the street from our projects. And he was like, this, this, he was like, this street right here is the widest street in Manhattan wide as in W I D E S T because he was like the actual disparity between just this side of the street and that side of the street is larger than anywhere in Manhattan. And what we're working in this room to do is to decrease that disparity as much as possible. Mm. Did not know that the school was that in terms of physically. Oh, you can see the PJs. Yep. You just like, there you go. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Same with um, CCM, Cincinnati uh university of cincinnati uh cincinnati conservatory of music is across the street from a project in cincinnati to the point where you come outside and you're like okay <laughs> oh <first> okay. Of <laughs> let me watch my head on swivel faster. yeah let me keep my head on swivel because you know well, that's, just- that's something i mean that's something that i learned like i said i always learn interesting things <laughs> i mean but i think it speaks to again long short long story short this was just ingrained in you from your education to just already being in a I household. I mean, I just always was somebody who, like, my mom is, like, very much about, like, this need, This is what's right, you know? It's very about justice. So I think it's, like you said, like, it's the household thing. Like, What did your, what did your mom do, if you don't mind me asking? She's what? a nurse, registered nurse. She's a nurse. She's a nurse. She's a registered nurse, and she was a workers' comp. Um, A workers' comp. She's going to be so mad that I cannot. But just, I know what you're talking about, but I can't think of it either. But they I don't know why the word... <laughs> They, the word for compensation thing, like the injury, like when people are injury, injured at work or something. Oh, workers' comp case manager. Oh my gosh. Manager. Like, okay. okay. That. <laughs> so she was a workers' comp case manager. And so she, you know, would work for insurance companies and work with people who were injured on the job to get them, you know, back to work. And I think for a lot of people, they look at the insurance company as the enemy, which I get it, you know? And so my mom was really just coming from a very... A healthcare professional place, which is like, if you really, you know, are trying to get back to work, then she wants to make sure that you're getting the best access to healthcare and make sure that you're getting the best um, results. And, you know, she would always say that it was just like wild because the, the immigrant community that is getting so attacked, right. And being continuously admonished for, oh, they're, they're lazy or they're coming in here with drugs, et cetera. She was like, they always was trying to go back to work. It was the white folks that was always trying to you know, cheat shit and, <laughs> and, you know, and, and, and listen, like, you know, work is whatever, but she was just like the way that they lie on this community as if they're the ones who are cheating the system and trying to get one over is just inaccurate. Well, even in that role, I mean, she was a nurse, but in that role, I mean, she really was an advocate. Um, and so, like, yes. I, and, and, and again, going back to why th- this you know, I we come up with this podcast because I think sometimes people think, well, maybe I don't want to go to law school. Maybe I don't want to go through all that. I'm not trying to be a lawyer. I'm not trying to, you know, maybe I'm not even trying to be a politician. Everybody doesn't have to be a lawyer. Everybody doesn't have to be a politician. You could be an advocate in anything you're doing. It could be healthcare. Yeah. It could be education. It could be all these things. And I know, at least for you, you know, anybody that goes to your Instagram, you know, Something is not right. You go. To, you go talk. To them, right. There are a lot of causes. I mean, you know, you had people get mad at you because you know people said she should be telling people not to go to Hawaii. I mean, just you know. So, but for I'm you, I'm like, I'm the. I'm. I. Yeah. It's like I can't win. And sometimes I'm looking at it and I'm just like, I know she's gonna respond. You know, every once in a while I'll put a comment like, 
let's let's calm down, folks. Let's let's just let's, let's just simmer down. Simmer simmer down. She says you know, again to to the point I said at the top of the podcast. Last time you're saying things that most of us you know aren't allowed to say or afraid to say or whatever. Right. Let's, let's and I know that. And I know that. And there's actually like a genuine purpose in like doing that because I think it's very cathartic for a lot of people. It is. <laughs> you know, like they feel seen, you know, like, oh, somebody said it. Oh, God. Okay. Somebody, oh, I didn't have to say it, but she said it. No, you you really are that that person. And so what I know there's just so much going on in the world, but what would you say in terms of causes you're probably the most passionate about? Hmm. I mean, I, I, on a basic note, I'm passionate about anything that is adversely affecting black folks. So there's, okay. that's like a top, 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 top. Okay. Um, that could be anything from, you know, criminal justice reform for, to whatever. Exactly. It, can, it can trickle down into so many different areas where there's an equity for black folks. Okay. All right. So that's like my entry point into a lot mm -hmm. of conversations. Um, I would say right now, the thing that is most worrisome for me is the attack on education okay. that's happening uh, on a multiple amount of levels, right? So the, the egregious and weaponizing, the weaponized misnomering of critical race theory um, as some sub, as a subject that's taught in grade school that teaches white people that they are less than um, instead of actually acknowledging that what they're actually trying to do is just not teach history uh, as it existed. Critical race theory, we all know is not a grade school level course. It is a college course <laughs> and it is based on the concept and the theory that the laws of this nation are inherently racist by nature of the context within which this nation was created and thus the laws are written. Ta-da, right? right? When I see the efforts being made to demean teachers and to undermine the unique role that teachers play in uh, our children's advancements and development, what I see is I mean, on just a surface level, a power structure that is using ignorance to remain in power. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. And I was, I was, I was, I'm glad you make the emphasize the point that it's it's not a grade school course. Like this is a college course because you have people in elementary schools and like some southern states like protesting. Like school board I'm like, meetings. I was just like, what? It's not even because they're dumb here. I was like, because they're why dumb. Is this one because the it, because it <laughs> because fucking so jackasses. So effectively confused. got other jackasses to believe that teaching something was black happening. history that teaching yeah. history is critical race theory and that's acknowledging exactly. racism in t in history is critical race theory that's what they basically successfully got people to believe so there that you racism have it. that racism you know that acknowledging racism is teaching critical race theory, which is actually not the case. And the reality is, is that racism does exist and racism did exist. And thus we can't really speak about or teach about history in a true context without this very, very large concept that has changed the global landscape for centuries, right? Like you read Abraham Kendi's stamp from the beginning and you're like, oh, wow. This this racism thing, they really just conjured this up and just it stuck. It was up, it was up, it was up, <laughs> and it stuck. Shout out to Cardi. Shout out to Bialkalis. Um Yeah, so, no, know, I I'm glad you that, clarified. that right I'm now is like confused about that, but okay, I see what they the what they did there. Okay. Cause I was just like, why are they having Oh no, it? it's it's a straw man. So what they're doing is they're you know, they create they create straw man arguments and they create these um, literally just lies to gar to rally their base mm -hmm. and their base doesn't know better and they see how effective it is. So why would you continue to educate a base if you see how easy it is for them to get behind you when they are uneducated? Had these people that they were trying to get behind them had even a, mm, 
a modicum more of of uh, of critical thinking, they'd be like, wait, what? <laughs> wait, yeah. wait, what? I mean, white women are just now realizing, like, wait a minute, Roe v. Wade, they they, they coming for us? <laughs> Hold up, that's crazy. And <laughs> they're like, if we just keep teaching them, just if we just keep teaching them about Jesus and nothing else, then. If we, no, let me correct that. If we just keep teaching them about white Jesus and nothing else, then we can stay in power. That's where we're at. And education, in my opinion, is the key to liberation. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. We saw slave revolts happening for quite some time, but we saw a complete shift start to truly happen when we combined the uh, passion and the violence of slave revolts with the strategy and the self-knowledge of being able to read and write and identify things um, on, a, on an intellectual level in that way. And they knew, they knew that that would happen. And they were fucking right. Yeah. Well, so keep reading. <laughs> yeah. So, right, exactly. Well, while we're on education and, and Roe versus Wade, that was, was going to be my next two questions. So you make this interview very, very easy. Um <laughs> Because you already know, you're like helping me transition. So in terms of education, I know there is talks about, you know, taxes and, you know, going to, you know, maybe finally giving people free education here in America. You know, there's some people who are taking issue with that. There's some people that are, you know, against, you know, student loan debt being forgiven, but yet, you know, their PP loans have been forgiven. I don't know. There's just a lot of people taking these other positions. Um, and Ooh. I think it's really important. More people. Oh, white people, white people that are privileged. <laughs> it's not, you know what? To be honest, though, it's not even just white people. It's Republicans. Right. So you could you could also be black and be Republican and just say, well, this is just another handout because that's their 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 basis of their whole party, that we shouldn't be giving all these handouts out. Let everybody pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. When, that's bullshit. When in, reality, when, when in reality, nobody pulls. Everybody has help. Everybody gets some help at some point. Um, no, I don't think you should over abuse, you know, help in a handout. You know, some people say people abuse welfare and things like that. No, it should be overly abused. You know but who's abusing say, welfare? The people who have a leg up. That's the thing. If you are born in this country at this point, so many white people in this country are living off of legacy that others were not allowed to develop Thank so you. when we talk about a leg up like motherfuckers y'all got a mountain up like when you look when you were born you, you had you, were born, you know yes. I, it's called white privilege you don't have to ask for it it's 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 given it's to built you built into the born. fabric yes 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 so and, when we and, talk about that i'm just like i but i think again again it comes back to knowledge it comes back to knowledge and awareness. And, you know, you have a constituency of people who are either ignorant, who are either self-loathing, those are the coons, or <laughs> who, <laughs> them's, them's the coons. To make it clear. <laughs> or who are opportunistic. Those are the three pockets of people that don't want to help other people. But, th but, but this is what I don't understand, especially about the student loans. Student loans are not just for Black people. Why would you want student loans to be forgiven? I mean, that could help white people too. So why why take the stand? I don't even think that's about race. I mean, I think part of it is because they did say that it would affect Black and brown communities mostly because, okay. you know, these this this is the community they said that had most access to student loans. I don't know how true that, num how, how true that is. But mm -hmm. to your point, I mean... I think it's less about who it's helping and more about who it's coming from. And by oh, the fact I that see. it's coming from Biden, it's just like, well, we just have to oppose it. The only thing that Republicans and Democrats have agreed on within the last, I mean, feels like 20 years is daylight savings. <laughs> yeah. The vote to end daylight savings was <laughs> unanimous. Everybody was like, I, I, I see you on that one. Let's make a toast. You know, but I finally got something across the aisle, something across the aisle, <laughs> you know, at this point, I'm neither a Democrat nor a Republican. I'm, I am a cautiously optimistic, um, citizen who is, and the only reason that my optimism exists is because I'm still here. 
and I know that I'm not the only one who like me is actively like, how can we achieve not letting these people take over? I'm not completely, I hadn't completely given over my, um, my hope to, to, to hopelessness, but I will say that, you know, when it comes to the student loans and the Democrat Republican of it all, you know, Republicans are fighting a very basic fight for them. It's you're either with us or you're against us. Democrats are, you know, doing a whole other thing that isn't really effective in fighting, right. uh, Republicans on a, on a grand scale, because at this point it's a cult. You said it. I didn't. <laughs> there you I mean, it. the people at this at this point, the people who are like, "I'm a Republican, but I'm not for Trump." I'm like, "What the fuck are you? What are you?" Because your party—that's what your party is about. And even if they're not about him personally, they are absolutely about the. They're absolutely about continuing the um, the trend of power that he has set forth. So whether it's him continuing that trend of power or DeSantis or Marjorie Taylor Greene or the rest of these jackasses, that's what they about. So if you are against that, you can't send, you can't at the same time call yourself the same as them. Right. They're also out here calling themselves Christians. So I'm looking at my other Christian folks like, well, what y'all gonna do? Cause they just taking your Jesus <laughs> and running. They are running with your Jesus right through the mud. They make you it? look bad. They make you look bad. Yes. Um, and, it, and it's interesting that you said the thing about, you know, identifying whether you be Republican, Democrat, and like, you know, some people say, well, I just vote the issues, whatever the case may be. But it's interesting you say that because, you know, anything that majorly happens, you know, Trump like tries to take credit for it. Like, you know, it didn't happen. It happened. And I will say this. He is absolutely right. Him putting all those Republicans in the Supreme Great Court. Job very strategically, he should take her job. He, he, if, if he set out, to, he actually accomplished what he set out to do. And so Great with, job. That being, with, they, with that being said, as you said at the top of the podcast, they are coming back. They're on a break, they, but they're coming back. People are still, you know, infuriated about Roe versus Wade. And I think I had made, I think Forbes had interviewed me about my perspective of how it just dis disenfranchises particularly Black people. This this overturn that like everybody doesn't have that babysitters. Everybody doesn't uh, can't go just drive to another state and take off. Everybody doesn't have the resources to do that if all of a sudden their state decides that they can't. Uh, you know, this doesn't take into consideration if somebody has a medical issue it has nothing to do. Maybe they wanted the child, but there's a medical issue. It's like, nope, you're going to keep your baby, you know, even though, you know, you may die, you know, it, some of these states, it's just not taking that into consideration now that this has happened with Roe versus Wade. So my question to you is, well, actually, before I ask my question, this person, after I posted the article, right, the interview, you know, you know, we love our, our, our Twitter folks, our Twitter trolls. Someone wrote underneath my article, well, I don't understand how you could be black and write this article because, um, you know, Planned they Parenthood, used, Margaret they, Sanger, they, right? Planned Parenthood, you know, that was used to kill all these black babies. So, you know, basically, you know, you should just basically look at this as a good thing. And I'm just like, I'm not saying that there wasn't some undercover strategy and purposely going to certain communities, putting more Planned Parenthoods in certain black communities so that that could happen. I'm not saying that th that didn't happen at all. What I'm saying is it still doesn't take away from my argument that someone right now that doesn't have the resources to keep a child or medically mm -hmm. should be keeping a child, if they're in a particular state, they are stuck. It still doesn't take away from my argument. And, and so I had nope. to kind of let that person know on Twitter. He didn't say nothing else after I said that. But I don't like how, you know, he got under my nice little article from Forbes, <laughs> you know, coming with his junk. I'm not like you, man. I'm not, you know, sometimes I don't have tough skin. So, you know, really, I was really- I don't have tough skin. <laughs> well, I'm a you cancer. do a very good job at, 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 at coming back at people. And sometimes- It's just volume. If you were doing this as much as I am, you'd be doing the same thing. Yeah, I'm just, I, it's not tough skin as much as just practice. <laughs> yes, maybe it's I'm just, I don't have practice. But what, but what are your thoughts on that about how there is this argument that, well, we're saving Black babies. So this is a good thing. If saving Black babies means hurting Black mothers, what are we talking about? There you have it. Yeah. I mean, because that's the real conversation. And if saving Black babies means saving 
if saving black babies means saving black families, let's talk about that. But that's not what we're talking about. And when people say that, that's not what they're talking about either. They're just holding a strong end argument in front of you because it's something to say. Yes, Margaret Sanger was on some eugenic bullshit. Yes, that was, you know, at the impetus of Planned Parenthood. We are a long way away from that. Planned Parenthood has definitively turned and pivoted from that narrative. Planned Parenthood has a, a large, vast number of diverse women who work within its ranks. And it has continuously provided services far beyond abortion in a number of communities that did not have access to those healthcare resources. Just basic healthcare. Just so basic there's healthcare. just that. Like my first gynecologist appointment was at a Planned Parenthood. So there's that, right? But there's also just the reality that saying, okay, well, you know, they were trying to kill black babies and this is saving black babies leaves behind an entire narrative around what are the other things that are needed in order to truly not just save a black baby, but allow for a black baby to thrive. And those things are not in place. And when people say that to you or say that to somebody about Planned Parenthood, I'm like, first of all, Planned Parenthood isn't the only place that provided abortion um, options for people. And ultimately, if you're not going to talk about the comprehensive picture of things, don't talk about shit talk about at it. all. Yeah. Don't talk about let's, shit let's, at all. Let's talk. I think that's a good answer. And they're let's talk never about talking about protecting women. Never. They're never talking about protecting yeah, black women. We're the ones that are having to carry it and push it out. And <laughs> and I never. love when I love when men try to speak up because it's like you'll never experience this. Even if you wanted to, biologically, you'll never experience this. Please, please pipe down. Please Cut pipe it down. And so I think that's why it's also just like an extra insult when you feel like you have like these majority, like old white men sitting on a Supreme Court, you know, uh, panel making a decision. I actually, um, before uh, 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 Supreme Court Justice Ruth uh, passed away, I actually was sworn into the Supreme Court bar and I actually got to see her and Everybody else, you know, I didn't know what to expect because it's like the courtroom is actually much smaller than what you would imagine it to be. And, you know, they're human beings sitting up there, you know, behind mm -hmm. with the rows. But it was a very like, like an aha moment because like everyone's being sworn in, you know, they're saying your name. And, you know, I already know that I'm the only Black female in this particular swearing in class. So overwhelmingly all the names, you know, Becky, John, whoever, you know, they're calling on the names. And then they get to my name, which my name is Jahan Carter. That's like my full name. They actually pronounce it correctly and all that. But I stand up. And so it's like this Black girl standing up, you know, being sore dead. And so, you know, she kind of looked at me like pleasantly, like, oh, at least, you know, there's there's somebody else here, you know, like, <laughs> you know, right. there's, some, there's some diversity here. This, this is her, but it's just like, it's crazy out of all these people I'm being sworn in. And I'm just the I'm just I'm I'm the only one. Um, and just looking at all the justices in their faces, it was very. I, I can't explain. It was just a very surreal experience looking at the people that really do have the laws. Determine of the land. yes. It's very. It was very surreal. Looking that's them very in their behind face. the curtain. At that's seeing it, the wizard. Yes, I I will never forget that experience. Um. With that being said, I wanted to just close out. I know you said that, you know, just in general, you know, you're rooting for your Black folks, anything that's going to, you know, if there's a disparity against a Black person, you're going to speak against it. Um, something that, again, has not passed, and I don't know if it'll ever pass, is the George Floyd bill. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Asian hate pass right away. You know, we had all these other bills pass right away. Um but, you know, everything that happened through the pandemic with George Floyd, and it didn't start just with George Floyd. I just think that was just everybody was stuck at home and then it just people just went crazy when they saw it, like enough was enough. They named the bill after him to combat what um, my viewers know I talk about all the time, qualified immunity, where, you know, police, quote unquote, doing their jobs, they're not held to the their, their misconduct. You know, they're not held accountable for the misconduct because they're doing it in the scope of their job. So a lot of times, you know, they're not, 
held liable, um, at least not criminally. You know, you can civilly sue people, you can sue the state and get money and all that. Uh, but people like Breonna Taylor and, you know, just there's just been so many people that have been killed because of misconduct. They've created this bill. It hasn't passed. And then kind of in the middle of this, you know, we we get some good news, like, oh, something, something new is happening with Brianna. What, what is it? Because, you know, they already said, oh, no, she was, they were endangering her neighbors. We're just going to move forward with that. We're not going to move forward with anything that relates to her, right? So, you know, we were already salty about that. And then we hear something new going on on the federal level. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts about, and even with this, it's really about the search warrants. <laughs> it's not really about, you know, her, you know, as it relates to her actual killing, but at least there's some movement with holding police officers more accountable. Just what are your thoughts? You know, we're almost two years later with something finally moving forward with Brianna and just your overall thoughts about qualified immunity. I mean, qualified immunity being revoked would literally change the landscape of policing in this nation, in my opinion, in a positive way. Um, I think so many people go into law enforcement because they know they can harm people with qualified immunity. And so I am not somebody that believes in the abolition of police. I still think that there is a significant amount of crime that does need to be dealt with forcefully. However, mm -hmm. however, I do believe that there are certain parts of policing that cannot be dealt with in a reformative way. They need to be dealt with in a direct, like retractive way. And that's one of those, you know, I am of a mind that what really needs to happen is all of these police commissioners need to be independently, and I mean, all of them need to be independently reviewed. And these, these departments need to be gutted because the records upon which they have existed in terms of their profiling, their uh, discriminatory practices, and the way that they are just murdering at will is an endemic. It's an endemic, it's endemic across the actual field of policing. So qualified immunity, I do believe being eradicated would literally change the type of people who even sign up for this job, right? Mm, getting like, to the root of it. Yeah, yes. you're right. I see. Because sometimes I say the chicken or the egg, what, what part of the, the equation should we solve? I've never heard anyone say it that way. You're right. If, if they, it would just change the whole scope of who's even applying to be a police officer, you know? Yeah. Like, because they knew, wait a minute, if I applied and I, and I start with some racist BS trying to harass people, I'm going to be held accountable. So is it even worth me signing up in the first place? It would just change the landscape of who's applying. That quick, that's like deep. off yeah. top, like that's like an immediate, like, and then the next would be changing the requirement, like the actual tests that you have to take and the actual education level that you have to take. But then when we have folks like, you know, DeSantis down in Florida saying that teachers don't even need to have a high school diploma to teach, I, <laughs> you know, we, I can't stress enough that it's not about like, oh, this person is so smart or this person is such an intellect, but there is something to be said for positions of power need to have a level of expertise. The fact that government roles and, and presidents, et cetera, don't have to have any level of experience is like beyond my scope of, of comprehension. Like in order to be a Supreme Court justice, you, sh you used to have to have a certain level of experience to be able to even be considered for that. Then you see someone like Amy Coney Barrett and you're like, how the fuck did you end up here? You, you just tripped and landed in a damn <laughs> Supreme Court justice. How the fuck did you, you know, the same and, she got, and she literally has this job for life. For life. She it for the right, unless she for decides life. to retire, she literally has it for life. The lady, Yet they the wanted lady to like just voted for Trump. Scold Pataji, who was Harvard graduate. They didn't even let Merrick Garland go through. They didn't even let him do the hearing. Okay. So, you know, when we look at policing and the, the George Floyd bill, it's not going to pass because we live in a nation that doesn't see anything wrong with harming Black people. Mm. There you have it. You know, again, I, I give kudos to the people that, you know, get it obviously past Congress. They were able to pass it on that, but they just weren't able to pass it on the Senate side. And that is how our judicial, judicial system works. 
has to pass on both sides. So unless we get some different senators in there to say, you know what, let's take a look at this bill again. Yeah, it it going back to what you said, this is why you have to vote, you know. There you go. Your I was about to bring it back, so you brought it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because if you had some different senators, maybe we would have just enough senators just to get it across the pass. Because it's not that every senator has to vote yet. You need 60. Just a certain amount. Right. So, yeah. you know, I, I think, like you said, I think the messaging across the board with this episode, you know, you really brought it home in terms of just, you know, how do we hold ourselves accountable in terms of how we participate in this process as individuals, but also like how we hold the people that we put in office accountable um, for the laws that, like you said, at some point it's going to trickle down and affect you. Um, yeah. And so, like I said, I, for that reason, yeah, that it probably won't pass for that reason. I, I am happy though, that there is at least something federally being brought against, uh, you know, the, the officers. And I believe um, if he hasn't already did it, I believe one of the officers is already just going to plead guilty. He's not going to go through a trial and all that. He knows what he did with the search warrants for fraud. Um, so we're going to get at least one guilty verdict, one out of four officers that participated in those um, that it, it, invalid search warrant. And, uh, you know, I, I just pray for her family all the time. You know, unfortunately, even with all this, it's never going to bring her back. Um, and right. that's just like a whole nother conversation about just, you know, black victims and how, you know, um, you know, these people, you know, they become famous. Um, I was thinking about writing an article, how these people kind of become famous in death. Like they're like ordinary citizens. And then this happens to them. And in death, they just become this bigger a thing. Symbol. They become martyrized. And it's like, they did not make that choice. A martyr chooses. Mm -hmm. they didn't and make that so, choice. you know, their families have to carry, you know, this burden, you know, for as long as they're on earth, you know, that their child is kind of the face of this or the face of that. So we keep those families in prayer. We just keep this nation in prayer. This just seems like there's just always something going on. As soon as, you know, one thing yeah. kind of calms down, it's like a war, a new disease, you know, whatever. Uh, but we like to end the, the, the podcast with positive moments uh black excellence moment of the week we actually have two we have barack obama who won girl i gotta go i've been know, here girl. for an hour <laughs> narrator for great we haven't talked about my tour at all national <laughs> parks we just want to give him a shout out but quickly tell our audience where can they see you next? I know a lot of people that listen to the podcast obviously in California, but you don't have to be in California to see Amanda. So no, I'm on tour. Like I'm touring yes. the nation. I'm yes. all over give the them, place. Give them your website, please, please. So the Black Outside Again tour is in full effect. You can go to amandaseals.com. Um, I am going to be in, when does this air? Do you know? Uh, two days. Oh, okay, perfect. So I will be in Houston on the 30th. I will be in Louisville, Kentucky on the 1st. Uh, I will be in Detroit in the D on October 9th. And then you can catch my show Smart, Funny, and Black in Atlanta on the 15th. And I'll also be doing Smart, Funny, and Black, a special Halloween edition where we're asking folks to dress up as their favorite Black characters. So I hope I see some Claire Huxtables <laughs> in the building. And okay. that is October 29th in Brooklyn. And then I have a bunch more dates. I'll be hitting Chicago, Philly, Nashville. Uh, Oakland. So go to amandaseals.com and uh, and obviously you, you can it. follow her Instagram. It's always on yes. Instagram, even if you're not on the site. If you're just one of these people to just follow Instagram, follow her there. And obviously you can always get her her doses uh, of the day or the week of whatever she's advocating for. I, I definitely, if you want a cathartic <laughs> experience, I I suggest highly you go to her Instagram page. Thank you so much, Amanda, for your time. I know my audience Thank is going to cherish this episode, and we can't wait and we're excited to see what's next for you me too girl <laughs> me too thank you so much have a good one